I, I think I'm talking too much. And uh, I want you to talk much more. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a big group. It's, it's quite difficult to get you all talking. Uh, but the, the one thing I think we should do is tomorrow you come and to the class and re you report back on your projects. Okay? Can you do that? That's fine? Just briefly say this and this and this. Uh, the other thing I want to say, when you report back, don't get the person who knows everything to report back. I want each of you to be able to report back. Okay? So the purpose of this course is not uh, to teach the people who already know, but uh, to teach those who do not know. And uh, those who do not know uh, should also talk, that we can see uh, what they don't know. Is that clear? So if you report back tomorrow, we'll do it here in class. Uh, we, we come up and we talk, uh, well, we, uh, how much time do you want? Five minutes each? Was that too much? Hmm? One? No, no, that's too much. <laughs> no, that's too little. No. Five minutes, about, more or less. Huh? And uh, is that all right, tutors? Does five minutes sound okay? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, then we, uh, uh, we can uh, start a discussion about the different problems and we see between the groups also what the problems uh, uh, are in the various groups and there is a common, uh, a common subject which we are working on and that is energy and so we must not lose the connection between the different topics which you are working on and maybe this will also help but the main thing is uh, I want you to talk more and uh, let's try this this session already uh, whether I can get uh, you to talk more uh, and not me talk all the time yeah Uh, well, just anything about the report, the progress, how, what you have done, and uh, the problems you have encountered, uh, which you are struggling with. Huh? Just tell us, it's, don't, say, don't try to make it wonderful, you've solved all the problems. It's just as important to tell us these problems you have not solved yet, huh? and you're looking at it, and you would like uh, the tutors to assist you in it, or like me to assist you in it, or something. Yeah? So that we, uh, we, it's basically a report back on, on how far you are at the moment. But again, there is typically a leader in a group, which is good. But I don't just want the leaders to talk. I want... Um, I would like the different students to talk, okay? How you arrange it exactly, whether each one gets, takes one minute or whether you... That, that I leave up to you, but we want to, a distribution of students talking. Now, uh, we have started now uh, with, uh, uh, with quantum states or quantum physics. And uh, this is what I will be doing uh, during this week and, and, and possibly uh, uh, a bit of next week. Uh, and what we've done in classical mechanics uh, will be useful to understand what we're doing in quantum mechanics. So just to recap, the... Uh, Classical mechanics uh, was, the mechani was the physics 
uh, of uh, the 90, up to the 19th century. There's still lots of classical mechanics being done now. It's still interesting topics, complicated topics. Maybe you've heard about the theory of chaos. The theory of chaos is a topic in classical mechanics which only happened uh, from the, uh, which was really only researched uh, from uh, the middle of uh, the previous century onwards. And uh, we're not going to talk about it, but I'm just saying there is still some life in classical mechanics. And together with the classical physics, there was electromagnetism. Electromagnetism is a beautiful subject. Robert de Mello Koch will teach you that topic. So that is why I have not done anything in it. Uh, but the, the culmination of, uh, uh, of uh, electromagnetism came with Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations, and they were uh, proposed by Maxwell in 1870-something. I'm not quite sure. It's around there. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and and uh, that gave a picture of a very clear picture that light is a wave. Light was a wave in classical mechanics. And uh, Newton had actually said uh, long before that that light was, were particles. This was Newton's ideas about light. They were particles. And, uh, and then this idea evolved through optics. Um, you know we have uh, geometric optics and we have physical optics. And physical optics makes use of this idea that light is a wave. And so if we think of a wave, the simplest thing to think of a wave is you go to a pond. Uh, that's a pond of Francais, a lac, a small lake. Uh, uh, you go to a pond and you throw a stone in it and then you get uh, uh, you, you, you get these this, these waves moving like that. Hmm? So you get waves moving out. Um, and uh, that is a, is, a, is a good model to think of uh, what is a wave. And uh, so light is also such a wave. And uh, if you now uh, put a something in between here, say uh, you put a wall there and a wall there and so on, then this wave will go up to there and and then here it will, there a new one will start like this and uh, and here also a new one will start uh, and it will go like this. I mean you can do this experiment uh, wherever uh, there is a pond. And then you have the superposition uh, principle basically that they, uh, where the two high parts of the wave come together they get a little higher and where they are, the low parts are, they're a bit lower. You know? So, so you, you add these amplitudes. You add these amplitudes. And the same thing, the same idea uh, is uh, is happening in uh, with light. You can do this experiment with light. You can have a light shining here and the same thing will happen. No? And so this is a good uh, demonstration uh, why light is a wave. Okay? Uh, so and this experiment here, which I've started drawing, starting from water, uh, is uh, uh, is uh, 
is called the double slit experiment. So I have two slits here, two openings. Okay. Uh, if I take in light and I only have one opening, a single slit experiment, and I have this light source here, light coming out here, uh, then, then I just have this one thing going out here. And so if I look at what the light will be on here, on the screen which I put there, uh, then I will get uh, something which is a maximum here and then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and so these are these different waves that, that and so this is the spec the, li the, the light which I get from a single slit experiment and uh, uh, from a double slit experiment, however, like this one, I have my light coming from here again, uh, arriving on, on the screen. I do not get two times this, because the light interferes. This light that comes through here uh, and that light coming through, the, uh, uh, through here interfere. And so I will get a, a peak whenever this path, this length of the path and this length of the path is so that uh, they, are two, they are equal to the wavelength of the, of the light. So then I will get, in fact, a spectrum uh, which looks like this. This is all classical mechanics, uh, classical optics. It'll look like this, which is not the sum of these two. And the reason being that this light, this light which comes through here and this light that comes through there interferes. And whenever this is this is up and this is up, then they two add together, like the water, the, 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 uh, the, the water wave. And uh, so, so this is actually all a very good uh, demonstration, and there are many demonstrations. I'm just showing one. This is a very good demonstration why light is a wave. Uh, but then at the beginning of the 20th century, the last century, there were basically two things. Uh, the one uh, was the black body radiation, which has a specific form. Uh, we will probably have a report on that uh, uh, tomorrow. But that if you look at the you, you look at the frequency uh, and the the intensity and the frequency uh, as a function of frequency uh, of uh, of light coming from a body which is uh, uh, which is uh, uh, let me plot a wavelength here. No, it doesn't matter. Uh, I can just as well uh, frequency. Uh, <clears throat> uh, freq uh, the wavelength is one over the frequency. This is an inverse. Uh, so if the if the body is very cool still, I mean you're heating this body. You have a piece of iron, say, or something, and you heat it, and you look at it, and you see nothing. Okay. And then heat it more, heat it more. Then so slowly you see it shining red. Okay? And then you heat it more, and then it becomes more red. It's a stronger red. And so uh, the free, uh, red light has a low frequency. So what you get actually is if you measure that, you get actually something like this. 
uh, and say red is somewhere here. The, the frequency of red is somewhere here. You get something like this, and it becomes more and more red and so on as you heat it. You can see that a globe and so is, is a thing like that. You heat it, and that's why it shines. And so on. But if you now heat it more and more, then it, it goes into other colors as well, and eventually it becomes white. So it becomes, and then if you pl plot this thing now, the intensity at a higher temperature, and say this is T, T high, T is somewhat higher temperature. If we think of high, what is high is uh, the, the sun's temperature is about 6,000 degrees. And so that's high temperature. And that looks, gives us white light, which you can break up in the rainbow and everything. You can see it's white light. It has all these different frequencies in it. Uh, and so in order to describe that, uh, it was a problem. That was a problem in the, in the, 20th, uh, in the 19th century. In order to uh, describe that, uh, Planck assumed that lights didn't come in, as, as, as light doesn't come continuously, but comes in little packets. And, and these little packets uh, we now call photons, these little packets of light. The second, the second important uh, aspect where it happened uh, was uh, when Einstein looked at something called the photoelectric effect. So you shine light onto a metal and you see electrons coming out. And then these electrons, and if you study that experiment, you can only really understand it by saying it's not a continuous wave of light. It is something which comes in little packets. And so he had this thing, E is equal to H nu. The energy of a photon depends on the frequency of these, these packets. And so again, there was this relation between uh, light being not a wave, uh, but being a particle, and that was called a photon. And, this, this. and so we have this duality. Sometimes we like to think of, uh, of light as a, uh, uh, as a wave, and sometimes we like to think of, uh, 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 of light as a particle. And uh, this lets me think of these two farmers <coughs> who had a fight about their water rights. And so they, were, they decided uh, to, uh, to come to the priest and said, ask the priest, well, what should they do? And so the one uh, who was telling the story uh, he was saying, well, you know, our fathers already had settled this and they decided uh, this is my water and not his. Uh, and uh, so the priest says, you're right, brother, you're right. <coughs> and so the other one comes and uh, he says, yes, but you know, at that time uh, we both had sources of water, but that has dried up and now the, the fear thing is to to share this water. And uh, so the priest says to him, uh, you're right, brother, you're right. And so the first one says to the priest, but, uh, but uh, Father, we, we can't all be right, both be right. And he said, you're right, brother, you're right. <laughs> and so, so he, <laughs> So here we have this, this thing, uh, we have two different pictures, and they, they, they seem to not both be possible. Uh, so, so, so we need to think a little deeper about what, what is behind all of this. But coming back to this picture, uh, 
And this is called the discussion of the double slit experiment in quantum mechanics. And you'll find it in every quantum mechanics book. You will find this idea about discussing the double slit experiment. What happens now, you, you, send a, you send a photons now, you send them to this thing. Now if the photon goes through one slit, the spectrum looks like this. And if, this, if the photon co it comes through the other slit, it looks also like, maybe shifted a little bit, it's, but it looks similar to this. And so you, you have you have, uh, uh, you have these two pictures, and if you add them together, because you say, well, maybe some of the photons go through there and some of the photons go through there, then you don't get this. Because uh, there is a superposition, as in the wave, in the wave, the wave nature tells you there is superposition. And so the photons actually coming through this uh, get, get superimposed. Uh, so it looks as though one photon, if you think in terms of one photon, that this photon goes through this slit and through that slit. Uh, and uh, so and you can try to check that. You, you, you close one of the slits and you see you get that spectrum. And you close the other slit and leave, make this open this again and you get again that spectrum. Now you leave both of them open and you get this spectrum. So you get something quite different which tells you that the photon is not going through one of these slits only. It's going to uh, in a way going to th through both. And this is not only true for photons, this is true and this experiment can be done with, with many particles. This is true for electrons, this is true for protons and, and any particle, if you shoot them onto this and the dimensions are right, then you get a superposition and you get this sp spectrum which actually tells you uh, the particle moving through here is, is not uh, localized. It is not so that you, uh, that, that, that you can say it goes through this, this, line, uh, this line. It can go through this and that to some extent. So it's not localized. It's not at a specific position. Uh, and, and you can do many, many descriptions of this. And it has been a discussion for, for almost a century, people discussing all these, uh, these, uh, these things. Uh, and so one of the resolutions, well, one of the resolutions is uh, that uh, one tracks writes down all the possible tracks uh, the photo, a photon, a localized photon could take, but only take that as a, as a, uh, uh, a, a chance that it will go that way, the probability of it going through that, uh, and you add the probability of it going through another way, and you add these together, and then you square, uh, then you square it after that and then you get this spectrum. So, so there's one way of doing this uh, called the path integrals. Uh, we will not do that, but it's a very nice part of, method, uh, of uh, uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, the, the, the basic solution ca comes from this idea that you say a proton or an electron or any particle uh, cannot be pinpointed both in its position and its momentum. 
So the, the certainty with which you can know its position and its path is given by something which is of the order of a constant called Planck's constant. Now Planck's constant is a very small number. Uh, nobody knows it? Uh, here's some 6.6 we, we, we make dot huh? it's just it's just the French and the Germans and the South Africans who, who, <laughs> who use who use a comma huh? the English words use a dot uh, okay <laughs> and I prefer uh, I'm not always conservative, but in this respect, I'm conservative. Uh, uh, I never agreed with this comma which, which the guys uh, introduced. Uh, uh, even though I have a German background and everything, uh, we use a dot. Times? Minus 34. Joules seconds. Okay, so you know Planck's constant. The, uh, the units must be right. This is position and this is, this is momentum. And uh, uh, so, so that together must, must be joule second. Huh? And so this is a, this thing is called uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty relation, uh, which is a word I don't like. Uh, uh, in, 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 in German it's a different word. In German it's uh, unschärfe relation, and which says it's not sharp. Uncertainty means you, you don't know what you think. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't like, it looks as People say these guys who do quantum mechanics, they're uncertain about what they do. Uh, <laughs> and I don't think we are uncertain about what we do. We, we just know that the nature isn't giving us sharp results. It's giving us a distributed result. <clears throat> okay, so that is, that is, uh, that is generally uh, my introduction to why there is quantum mechanics. Um, so uh, what it actually what it actually means is uh, if I if I measure uh, P very sharply then x is, then I know very little about x. So if I know exactly what is the position of, uh, of, of the particle, uh, the, the momentum of the particle, I don't know where it is, okay? And if I, uh, fi uh, I measure its position very accurately, I don't know what its momentum is. And, yeah? Yes. Uh, otherwise I'll just see a particle behavior. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, yes. Why don't you come and, and do it for us? <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. I like it. Come. Let, uh, she, she, she has thought about this maybe in a different way in which I have thought, and now you, you want to make a no, statement. I just huh? make to discuss that we see wave behavior if the dimensions of the apparatus are comparable to the wavelength of the electrons. Yes, that yes, that's if right. If I make the, the, the dimension too big, I won't be able to, to see the wave behavior. Yes, that's yes, right, that's, that's right. Yeah, because what we need to, to know is that the wave will 
will uh, this 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 is given the wavelength is sitting here sort of mm -hmm. and and here and and so the these waves need to be uh, uh, close enough so that they can that we have a, a few wavelength differences in this path. So they can interfere. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise yeah. they don't interfere, they'll be just particles. That's right. I don't yeah. think you need to write anything. Okay, it. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good. The tutor gives the example. So any one of you who wants to say something like that, come up and say it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, uh, Brenda. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> so, 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 don't you think this is this is quite quite profound that I can't measure the the position and the momentum uh, very sharply? I mean, it's totally different from what we did when we did our classical mechanics last week. We had this picture that a particle was moving and at every point in X, which is a function of time, it would reach this point, we would know, if we knew the, if we knew the forces and everything, we would know the position. And so both the position and the momentum uh, could be known sharply. We could know exactly what it is. And that is what the whole uh, business of classical mechanics was built on. We were actually writing equations. If, if that is the position, we were writing, making diagrams of uh, phase, phase uh, diagrams where we have X and P, uh, and we would say uh, this thing would, would move like this. So at every T we would say, we can read off what is, the, what is the position, and we can read off what is the momentum. We read it off from this diag uh, diagram here. But now we say, no, 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 wait a bit, we can't do that. Uh, the only thing we can do is sort of say it is in this, somewhere in this box. The particle at any point is in, is in here. And I can make this box uh, like this, or I can make it like that, but the, the full area of that box is the same of the order of Planck's constant. So whatever I do, I can't make it smaller in both directions. So we have a, a, uh, an unsharpness, an uncertainty, as it's called in English, um, uncertainty relation about the, where this, uh, this uh, particle is. <clears throat> Now, the, uh, so it, 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 it is obvious that uh, uh, the uh, description of classical mechanics is, is not possible for, for such particles. No? And so what is being done now is being, this picture is changed into a picture of uh, uh, of operators, so we will not have a value of a position. We will have a measurement of a position, and I would call that I would call that x. It's an operator. I'm not going through all the steps how this was arrived. I'm just telling you what the picture is now. Like I told you what Newton's laws were, I didn't tell you uh, exactly how they emerged. Uh, 
So we are now discussing what is quantum mechanics. So what, from this realization we see we can still have a state of the particle which we will call, which we will call psi and we can write it as this. This is a notation uh, which is being used in quantum mechanics. This is just a vector and this is an operator and uh, this thing measures the position of, of, of this, this state. And so, so we're introducing very abstract things and I'll make it more concrete just now. Uh, <clears throat> and in the same way we say momentum is not something I know exactly what the number is, uh, but I have an operator of momentum and that gives me a result and I'll talk about these results just now. Uh, and this is the measurement of the of this state what the momentum is. And the, 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 the clear uh, indication is now uh, that if I, uh, I just want to write, write that right, yeah. If I do the measurement of the position and the momentum in a specific sequence uh, then I get another result than if I do it in the opposite sequence. So this result, if I try to measure the, the position and then the momentum, uh, it will give me a different result to to if I measure the, the momentum and then the position. And this is, this is sort of very abstract and we will make it much more concrete in a moment. And so uh, this thing uh, is of course uh, for a mathematician that's, that's very easy. This is just the, the commutator of x and p. Uh, these, these two do not commute. Uh, and the commutator of these two uh, is I times H bar, um, which w with, uh, where H bar is, is this H up there divided by 2 pi. So H bar is equal to H divided by 2 pi, and so that is equal to about one point something times 10 to the minus 34 joule second. <coughs> uh, so, so this is a basically a basic postulate in, in quantum mechanics. And it, it, it basically says what we have discussed briefly in terms of, of, of these pictures up here, that we cannot measure these things. And now, well, we still don't know what, what to do with all of this now, uh, but then there is this idea that classical mechanics, somehow, if h bar is very small, then classical mechanics is still okay, or if, if the, the results are very small, uh, as Brenda was uh, discussing, then I can do it still with classical mechanics, and so the, the thing is I want to take over uh, the formalism of qu uh, classical mechanics. Now I can't always do this. I must warn you, but for the cases we will handle, we can do it. And that's why I described classical mechanics so much uh, last week, uh, because I want you to know what are the equations in which we are going to put this in. And the the idea is that uh, uh, we have 
In classical mechanics, we have a uh, in classical mechanics, we have a we measure the energy which we are focusing on uh, by writing a Hamilton function, which depends on on p and x, and uh, we wrote this as uh, as uh, p squared over 2m plus v of x. So, so the idea is we have this function and uh, you give me the values of p and x and I put them in and then I know what the energy is. Huh? So this function, this Hamilton function, it plays a much more important role than I'm talking about now, but it has this role that I can recalculate the energy of it. I just put in P and X the values you give me and then I know what the energy is. So the, the formulation in quantum physics uh, retains as much as possible of this. And it says we don't, we don't now have a, have a function of P and X. Uh, we have an operator uh, which we can write, and uh, again, I must warn you, there are cases where I can't do that, but the ones which we use, we use the same as a classical uh, equation, and, uh, and this is V of the operator X. So we, we, we construct a Hamilton operator in this space, which is called the Hilbert space, uh, in which we uh, construct this operator, and we construct it in this way. And if I, w if I now want the energy, uh, what I do is I say I have a state which describes my, my system, uh, this, this state I, I introduced here, which describes my system. Uh, and what I do is I, I write this H and I put it onto this state and that gives me, this gives me the energy. So in order to get the energy of a state, I construct the Hamilton operator and I apply it to the state and that gives me the energy. So in the same way as in classical mechanics, I have a clear dis description on how to define, define the energy, okay? Okay, now, now this looks, uh, uh, this looks uh, uh, very abstract, and it is. This is, uh, I haven't really told you very much about what, what these different things are. Uh, and, but this is the abstract formulation in which uh, we do quantum mechanics. Now, there are specific, what we call, in, uh, in, in quantum physics, we call representations. There are diff specific ways of dealing with this abstract um, uh, formalism. And one of the representations, and I, uh, and, that's what, uh, and I want to stress that it's only one of them, uh, the so-called Schrodinger representation, uh, is, fits into this, this picture. Okay, now I'll give you the Schrodinger representation. And in, in the Schrodinger representation, x, the position, is important. Uh, so what we, we have is that this operator x 
applied to the position of uh, position state is x times x. I mean, this is this. It it just gives us x. So x is, is standing out. Uh, as, as the important thing comes to the foreground. It could also be momentum, but then it wouldn't be the Schrodinger representation. It would be a different representation. And, and so, the, so what we say then is that the operator x maps onto just onto the position x, and the, the operator p Maps onto what? Hmm? Okay. Uh, minus i h, or I, I prefer this uh, the way I remember it, h over i, d d x. So this this defines the uh, the momentum. And now I, I want to look, uh, and, and I have any, and, uh, oh yeah, and I have a, a function psi of x which describes the state. So the state in this language here. Um, state maps onto a function of x. Now, now this, is, this, is, this is the way um, the Schrodinger representation comes out of, of this formalism. Now I want you to just use that and just work in little groups and Calculate this in the Schrodinger representation. Show, show me that this is true in the Schrodinger representation. So what we do is we, we apply this to a certain state. So this thing is an operator equation. Applied to an to a state, and that is equal to this is when I when I write an operator equation, what I mean is that if I apply that to a certain state, then I get that. Okay? Okay, now please start working. Together. You can sit together. Using the Schrodinger representation, no? You use the Schrodinger representation and you, you show that the Schrodinger representation is consistent with that result. I think uh, most of you have finished. Uh, and I don't want a volunteer who knows quantum mechanics too well. You, you can volunteer. Okay, speak out when you write. So, can we have your attention? And if she makes a mistake, you criticize her. Huh? You don't want to criticize me, but you can criticize your fellow students. You can also criticize me. <laughs> Quiet, please. We have a lecturer here. Uh. <laughs> Yeah.
if we, we have just to replace to, to uh, replace X and P because here is the operator. We replace it with their expression. This and we have X. Now this is the plane is the field. Minus minus the this would be this operator x is the letter of this. This this expression levers minus e as we are x. But the second one, we have the derivative of, yeah. derivative of x applied to x and g t. Then the first one, like uh, Derivative, yeah. Give one and we have the and E done. Now we put E and derivative the And then this expression and this can Very nice. Thank. Any questions? Uh, he, he, he knows what he's talking about, so let me help you. Uh, what he's saying is, this is an operator equation, and if you want to transform it into a Schrodinger equation, you should actually make this psi of x. Huh? Okay, that's what he's saying. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's okay, yeah, but uh, that's... <laughs> Okay, uh, everybody understood it. I mean, this, uh, these, uh, yeah, very nice. <laughs> uh, we, we have a break now for five minutes, and then we will uh, uh, come back here. Okay, I think we can restart. Uh, this, this commutator between X and P is very fundamental and we will see and that that is equal to i h bar that is very fundamental and we will actually uh, solve uh, various uh, problems in uh, in quantum physics and it is basically it comes back to that you always you don't always see it so obviously but it's fundamentally in the background all the time is very important and that's what makes uh, quantum mechanics now we uh, uh, we want to proceed now uh, we want to see what uh, what H is applied uh, to psi is equal to Mm 
now quite quite soon uh, I will stop writing this like this in textbooks they don't write it that way yeah I, I'm just writing it at the moment to say to you watch this is an operator hmm? but uh, but uh, not very long then we know this is an operator and uh, we watch okay by, by ourselves uh, so if we now uh, want to calculate this I'm now taking this again uh, to the to the Schrodinger picture uh, well uh, let me first uh, say I also have E uh, on psi is equal to this and that is equal to that huh? okay so if I take this into the Schrodinger picture I have p squared so what is p squared momentum. Hmm? momentum yeah but I want to write the equation down Okay, this looks more familiar. Huh? Most of you have seen this. What is this? Schrodinger equation. Okay, so this is a, just a differential equation. And if you give me uh, the potential, this V, uh, I can solve this. I just have to think a little bit about what are the conditions uh, for the solution. And uh, so we actually need to just talk a little about what is this psi of x. Hmm? So psi of x is a function of x, some function of x, uh, which has what properties? <coughs> Uh, so, so if I if I integrate over this psi of x squared and dx, then I get y. Sorry. Why normal? Do I normalize it? Because it's a we interpret it as a probability. So the total probability, if I sum up all the possibilities, I get one. And if I sum up only uh, a part of it, say uh, from A to B, then I, uh, if I do this for a small part, uh, then I get uh, something that's smaller than one, and that's the probability that it is in, in the interval A, B. If, it's, if I look anywhere, then it must be somewhere. So it, then I get one. No? So, so this is, this is a, a condition on, uh, on this function. It must, it, must be, it must be finite. I, may, I must be able to do this integral and get a finite result, uh, which I then equate as equal to one and that I use as a normalization condition. So in other words, what I'm saying, uh, if, I, if I have the, a solution psi, then I have to take ax times psi, and I square it, and I integrate it over x, and that must be equal a squared, and I integrate it, and I get some result alpha, then I uh, divide alpha, uh, then I, uh, I know that a squared must be uh, 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 must, uh, I, I must divide this, this expression I know, so, sorry I, I did it wrongly now, but, but the, uh, 
uh, I must make sure that that result is one. And, and so I, I have to t uh, adapt A accordingly, okay? Uh, so if we, have, uh, if we have that expression, uh, we can uh, uh, we can do we can do everything in, in Schrodinger equation in one dimension, and this psi x squared. I make this x because psi could also be a complex number, and uh, uh, if I do a solution, but then I make it real this way. And so psi x squared times dx times a small interval x is the probability that I will find the particle in this, in this interval. Hmm? So, so, so that's the probability, and then I sum up all these probabilities, and that gives me, gives me one. Just as a simple uh, extension to what we have discussed so far, uh, we can now also say uh, what happens if we do this in three dimensions? Or two dimensions, three dimensions, and so on. Well, this is the one-dimensional del squared. And uh, so in, in three dimensions, or uh, we, will have, we will have this plus V of some vector R uh, applied to psi on a function which depends on a vector r. So this could be psi depends on x, y, and z. Uh, so it depends on, on three, three components. And that again is equal to e times psi. And that is the three-dimensional uh, Schrodinger equation. And uh, you will find that in almost all textbooks. And the, if we use uh, uh, Cartesian coordinates, we already know what this thing is. It's the x squared, d dx squared, d dy squared, d z squared. If we, if we use uh, cylindrical or no, uh, spherical coordinates, uh, we have to do what we did in classical mechanics and uh, uh, just just write these operators in terms of r, theta, and phi. And uh, I don't think we should spend time in the class uh, to uh, uh, to derive this. Uh, because you will find it in, in any textbook if you haven't done it already at some stage. Uh, uh, you will find it in many textbooks, and not only physics textbooks, also mathematics textbooks. Uh, so this is, this is very classical uh, So, so this is then in, in, uh, done in, uh, in three dimensions. And what one normally does is one writes this function, psi of r, one writes as if there is a symmetry in it. We write it as a function of r, and then functions which are, do not depend on r uh, which are called the, uh, what are they called? Uh, 
the spherical harmonics. You use these functions by solving the this 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 equa uh, uh, the theta phi part. Uh, you do that in classical mechanic uh, classical uh, uh, electromagnetism. Do you all know what this is? No. Okay, maybe we can talk a little about it, but it is uh, uh, at some point. Uh, we can, this is a function. You see, this is a function of R, and we divide it up into a function which depends only on the, uh, on the distance from the center and uh, the angles. And this thing will be the same irrespective of what a central potential is. If we have a central potential, it will just affect this part of the equation and it will not affect that part of the equation. And so this is something... Um, how, many do, how many have not seen this? Do not know what this is. those functions. Okay, maybe, maybe we, can, uh, we can at some stage uh, uh, describe them and see, see how, how to calculate them. Uh, it is a, is a, it's a classical uh, thing in, in, uh, in many problems which have spherical symmetry. Uh, it is not specifically a problem of quantum mechanics. It's a general problem. Uh, but it is in quantum mechanics, it's extremely important to do that. So, so maybe we should do that. But not now. Uh, Maybe one of the tutors can prepare a, 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 a little session for those who have never met that and, and do that or prepare it for here or one of the students who, who know this very well. What do you suggest? Hmm? Tutors. You don't want to do it. <laughs> Okay, so let's do, let's do first, just to get the feeling of all of this, we do a one-dimensional problem uh, with no potential except that the particle is in a box. So we just have a particle in a box. So we have a particle moving here to the wall, going back to that wall and going forwards and backwards huh? it's in, in a one-dimensional box. We can easily extend that through a three-dimensional box. The particle goes this way and it goes this way and it goes this way. Huh? So that is the three-dimensional box. Uh, uh, but uh, let me first do the one-dimensional box to understand a few things. And then we will eventually do the three-dimensional box as well because it is extremely important in its application. It, we will start counting the number of particles, particle states, which are in a three-dimensional box. You see, and this is something which is, which is different in quantum mechanics and uh, from classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, you could not have said 
Did you tell me how, how many things are on this paper? Was it you? No. No, it was someone else, but you were sitting here. Emmanuel. Huh? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Where is he? <laughs> uh, so, so in classical mechanics, uh, things are things are continuous. In, uh, in, in quantum mechanics, th things are in a way discrete. And you can say uh, how many states are there uh, of particles that can move this way, here. And how many can move, how many states are there of particles that can move uh, in this room? And uh, it is, a, it is a number. So why do you think it could be a number? What determines the, the unit in which I would count those states? Hmm? Yeah, but just before we do this, the solution. Why, why could it be true that uh, that the number of states is not? Why can I think of a number of states? So that means I must think of a of a unit volume which in which these states are. And now the, the states can have x and p, so there must be an, an interval in x and there must be an interval in p. So what could be the size of my little volume in which I say that is enough space for one particle? Hmm? H? Yeah, H. H, I think, H, yeah, H. So in one direction, it is H, three dimension, H cubed. So I, I, the one thing I could think about the number of uh, particles or, or states in which particles can be in this room is by dividing this little, this room up in little portions of, of h cubed. Put them one next to the other. And I'll give you just now a problem where you can do that yourself. Uh, where you can figure out how many, how many states uh, uh, we have. <clears throat> but so let's, uh, that was just a, an aside. I want to look at this equation up here. h squared over 2m, second derivative uh, with res is equal to psi of x. And uh, uh, so, uh, and the condition of solving this now is that psi is whatever I get uh, in the interval 0 to L and uh, so I, I try to solve it in the in the interval 0 to L hmm? where did the V go? V, there's no potential here the particle just goes zoop, 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 there's nothing uh, there's no potential. Potential is zero. The, the only interest why this is a problem is because the particle is confined. Confined 
know what that means? En français? Confiné. Fix. No, not fix. Fix sur un domain. Oui. <laughs> and so, in other words, uh, I'm, I'm going to find this in this interval, and I I, I know that uh, this thing is zero uh, with x uh, with x smaller than zero, and also with x larger than zero. Huh? This is this will be zero, and otherwise it it can be a function which I still. Uh, I'm going to find. And what is what is what sort of problem is this? How do we call it? Hmm? It's an ordinary equation. Uh, yeah, an ordinary differential equation. And there's another word for it's an eigenvalue problem. Someone was asking me, what is an eigenvalue problem? Uh, eigen is a, is a German word. Germans used to be very, very important in physics. <laughs> they still are quite important. Uh, but this is a mixture between... Uh, between German and English, eigenvalue, it is a problem which determines the eigenvalue of, uh, of, of this equ uh, equation, of, of the operator, and it determines the eigenfunctions. The eigenfunctions are those functions which uh, which when applied, when the operator is applied to them, give the eigenvalues. Huh? Okay? So an eigenvalue problem, quite generally, is an operator A uh, operating on some state psi, and that gives me an eigenvalue uh, times psi, and these eigenvalues, can, there can be a lot of them, uh, so I can index them by, by some index i. Hmm? So, so that, that is an eigenvalue problem. I have an operator operating on a state, on, on, on a uh, function or whatever, on, on a vector, and uh, I get the eigenvalue, and, and, and I get the eigenstate back, yeah? or the eigenfunction. I can function in mathematics and physics, we say state, because we think of states. Okay, so uh, this we can write as uh, d2 dx squared uh, psi of x is equal to r uh, plus uh, 2m uh, uh, h bar square times e psi of x and we want to solve this is equal to zero. We can also write this if we we can just write call this thing here k hmm? uh, k squared huh? yeah k squared uh, so we have this equation, D, and this is an equation which we know from, from many areas of, uh, of physics. Uh, it's just a wave equation. It's, it's the equation of if you solve any wave. And uh, then... Uh, what can we say? What is the solution? Cx is a k 
cos xx uh, that's enough it will be a cos because it uh, oh no it must be a, a sine no? sine sorry so it must be that and uh, but we also need to apply the condition psi x is equal to L uh, must also be zero. This is zero at x is equal to zero and this gives this is also zero. And so we can get that k is equal to n pi over L okay so this is this is the and that is related uh, to E because K is related to E and uh, and it is actually I can I can write down this relation uh, P is equal to H bar times K so if I if I put that uh, in here then I get for E uh, the uh, well let's you want to do that uh, so if you put in if you put in E is equal to H squared over 2M uh, times K squared uh, and uh, so this is actually equal to P squared over 2M in the classical field so I can see that this H squared K is is actually is actually P so I have a relation between I could imp uh, instead of writing uh, KN I could have used this relation and I could have written PN so a specific case is, is just PN <coughs> I don't want to complicate this too much for you But so let's let's just look what what happens. Uh, we have we have this equation and uh, the, this box from zero to L, and we have for n is equal to zero we have this thing. For n is equal to one we have this thing. Uh, sorry. Uh, let me let me not draw them on on the same. Uh, so, uh, this is now uh, psi. Uh, it, li it looks like this, and the next one looks like this, and the next one looks like this, and so on. Mm -hmm. So these are the different values of k, which we can get. Uh, Uh, which go up from n is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. No? And we can do this now uh, immediately in three dire uh, directions. And uh, uh, then we will have a kx, ky, and, and a kz. In three di directions, we will have uh, we we will have k n in the x direction is n x pi over l in the y direction. It's uh, uh, how do I write this y uh, x here 
and y and so on so that will be in uh, in the y direction over l and uh, similarly in the z direction and so if we put that into the energy uh, we get h squared over uh, 2m uh, uh, pi squared over L squared and then NX squared plus NY squared plus NZ squared. And so so these are these are the different states which the the particle uh, the particles can be in and uh, the thing I'm not just worried about the time I don't think we should do this now uh, the thing we should actually do now is find out how many if we give you I give you a certain value of p or a certain value of e in the three-dimensional case how many states are there okay so if, we, if I do this in one dimension uh, and I I give you in, in one dimension and I give, uh, give you an N, uh, or a value of P then you can tell me how much there are between P and P plus P and P, P plus DP uh, you, can, you can work that out from there uh, it will not be smooth it depends if I, how big I make dp, it may be zero or, or one, or, or if I make dp a little bigger, there may be more states in there. But I can, I can basically say in a small element I will have one state as I go up. If I do this in three dimensions, it's more complicated because uh, I will have to think is there a state in the x direction, is there a state in the y direction, is there a state in the z direction. Okay? I am discussing this problem uh, because it is important for the people who do the black body radiation. If you do black body radiation, you will have to count the number of states in which uh, the, the system can be. Uh, and this is what, what Planck did. Who does the black body radiation? Have you already counted the number of states? Hmm? I think we can't I think we can't do that problem now. Uh, because uh, I don't think if we start now that you will finish before before lunch. Uh, but uh, maybe we can do it tomorrow or so. Maybe people will tell us how they counted the number of states. Uh, but this is all there is from quantum mechanics which goes into statistical mechanics when you talk about the number of states uh, which you want to use in calculating statistical quantities. Uh, we just need, from this equation, we need to say in some value of, of the space 
you see P can be, maybe I should explain it a little bit. Uh, P can be anywhere in this, in this section. So uh, in, in two dimensions, P could be somewhere here. In three di and then I need to look how many states are there here, given, given that equation. And uh, in three dimensions, I have to sort of have a, a, an eighth of a ball. Uh, an eighth, because here I just have a quarter of, of a circle. And in, 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 a three, in three dimensions, I would have one eighth of a ball. And what I want to do is, I want to look how many states are there in this, uh, in, in, in this eighth of a ball. But what is actually more important is not in that eighth of a ball, but in the border around the surface of that ball. Because that would give me the number of states between uh, p square, uh, the the vector that would give me the number of states in the interval dp. So if I calculate the number of states in the interval dp, I would uh, uh, then be able to calculate thermodynamic quantities. But I think I think uh, it's wrong to. Uh, I th I'm just explaining to you what the what the program is, but I'm not going to do it now because I don't think we will we will finish. Okay. Hmm? Okay. What is a state? The state is a solution of the Schrodinger equation. So here we have the Schrodinger equation and here we have it again without a potential. That's the Schrodinger equation. Without a potential. And now we solve it and we get a lot of we get, uh, I drew some of them here, in one, in one dimension. I, I drew a number of them. Here, there's the first one, there's, uh, there's the second one, there's the third one, and so on. And uh, that is just looking in one dimension. But if I look in a box, in a th three-dimensional box, they can be either in this direction, or they can be in that direction, or they can be in that direction. And I want to know, given a certain momentum interval, and this room, uh, how many of these solutions will I find there? Is, that, is the question clear? Hmm? Not? If I say, uh, given a length L here, and an and a upper value of the energy, because you see I can express the, or for that matter, an upper value of the momentum. The energy is related to the momentum, or or an upper value of k. I say, I don't want to go more with k higher than a certain value. Okay? Then I'll ask you, how many, what is the value of n? How, how, far, how many such states do I have? n numbers the states. n is equal to 1 is the first, n is equal to 2 is the second, and so on. So I... I count this number of states, and I ask, how far do I get in, uh, in 100 times k? Well, I get to 100, n is equal to 100. 
And 100 times K gives us is a specific energy. Hmm? But this is easy in one dimension because you just, you just say if uh, the energy, uh, uh, well, you, you can just count the number of, of states uh, that, that go up to a certain value of K. But if you do this in three dimensions, it's a little more difficult. Uh, but it's the important, of course, and we want to calculate that. So if you, if you want to do that in three dimensions, um, you will have to count the number of states in this direction, and in that direction, and in that direction, and you limit them to a total value of energy, or total value of P, any of these. I mean, if you limit the value of P, you limit the value of energy. So I give you a value of energy or value of P and I ask you how many states are there? And we need to count them. And that is a big basis of statistical mechanics and it is something uh, which the people who do the project on uh, black holes uh, will need to do if they want to derive the formula for black holes. Ah, not black holes, black body radiation. You, you put me off. <laughs> black body radiation. Not black holes, of course. Black body radiation. If you want to calculate the number of states, you have to calculate those in the direction one, in the direction two, and in the direction three. Uh, we might go for lunch now. Uh, tomorrow uh, we will have these reports and uh, either tomorrow or the day after tomorrow uh, we are going to count these states. And I, I think you you can possibly start thinking about it. So my, my question is, what are the number of states in a, from zero up to a specific momentum P? And if I know that, then I also know how many there are in the shell uh, P and then a shell just above that P because the only thing I do is I take a, uh, this, uh, the sphere up to P and I differentiate it uh, and, uh, and then I get the, the, uh, the, the number in the, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, shell just above, above that sphere. I think I've lost all of you. Huh? But we will find each other again, okay? <laughs> and we will not lose this problem. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's, an it's an important problem in uh, statistical physics.